Okay, so I'm Sammy Postma. I am the events and education coordinator here at Goosefoot. And what that means is I get to teach all of our business workshops. I run all of our events like the street dances, Mardi Gras parties. And I run a lot of our web presence, including our website, social media, all of the fun stuff. So I get to share it with you guys. A uh, few housekeeping things for those of you in the rooms. There are bathrooms right around the corner. They are locked, but the code is on the sticky note on the door. Um, so feel free anytime. If I talk too quickly, please let me know. I do that sometimes. I get excited. So just let me know and I'll slow right down. Um, and this is a workshop, not a lecture. So please uh, feel free to you know, ask a question at any time. I'm not going to make you hold until the end. Um, we are largely going to be just kind of going over broad do's and don'ts and looking at the different platforms. But there's plenty of time at the end. If you have specific questions, we could always look into stuff. Uh, for you folks online, um, I can't really see chat very well, and I won't see if you click the raise hand icon. So if you have questions, please just mute yourself and ask them. Okay. So first up is kind of fundamentals of website. Before you ever start either revamping your website or starting a new one, you need to figure out what is it that you want the website to do? Do you want it just sort of as a modern day business card so people know how to contact you? Do you want it as an you know, inventory of your products or your photos? Do you want to actually do sales? Whatever you want it to do is really going to dictate what tool you use to build the site and how you structure it. So figuring out what you want it to do at the start is paramount. It's going to take you longer than you think. Tools today are incredible. They make making websites easier than ever, but it's slow going. Even for somebody like me who does this professionally and I work with a lot of different organizations on their websites, even a simple website is gonna take me a minimum of six hours. So it, to give yourself plenty of time, both to actually do the work, but also to um, learn new stuff, go look up answers if you need them, try different things. Don't get frustrated with yourself if it's taking forever because even the professionals take a while. Make sure you're regularly updating your content and your design to stay relevant. Things are constantly changing. You know, even Jim mentioned that. Website standards are shifting constantly. The tools available, um, a lot of websites around here were built like 2014 or earlier. They weren't built with mobile in mind. Nowadays, more than half people use their phone to access the internet. So it has to work on a phone. Um, you know, different standards come up, different tools that make things easier or faster. So, and then also just regularly updating your content, changing things on your website helps tell all those search engines that it is an active and useful website. Um, so it keeps it up higher. If you build your site and then never touch it again, after a couple of years, search engines are going to think it's dead and they're going to stop pushing it. So you got to tweak it every now and then. Yeah, I'll talk a little bit about search engine optimization. Um, and on that note, top search rankings does not happen overnight. I sat down with a potential client once who, like, we want to be on the top of the search results in time for wedding season, which starts next month. Not going to happen. <laughs> it's not. Um, unless you pay a fortune, it's not going to happen. It takes time to be noticed, to build those structures, to rank higher and higher. So don't get stressed out if you're not top of the results immediately. And especially nowadays, those rankings are really dynamic. So I will get different top results than you will. Your friend in Florida who's checking out your website for you is going to get different results because they live in a different place. Um, so it makes it even more complicated. And I mentioned this earlier, but about 60% of all internet users nowadays are accessing only on mobile devices. So either a phone or a tablet. Uh, there are actually about 15% of American households don't even own a desktop computer. So, it, you know, and that number wasn't heard of 10 years ago, five years ago. It was much higher, you know, much lower. People had desktops that they could go to. I know plenty of people who just don't anymore or even people who have computers, but they still spend the majority of their time on their phone. So it's gotta be mobile friendly. Uh, some basics of a site, just kind of overall structure. There's a lot of things you could add or take away depending on what you're doing with your site, what you want out of it, but you need a homepage. That is the you know central page people go to on your website. It's the first thing they see. So you don't have an option to not have one. 
Um, I would recommend an about section. Who are you? Who's your business? Who's your organization? What is it you do? Who are the people in charge? You need to have hours and location, especially if you're a physical location. If you're a purely online business, you can skip this part. Um, but if you have a physical location, you want people to be able to come to you, you need to be able to tell them when and how. Um, have a contact section. I don't care what your business is. I don't care even if it's a hobby. Contact section. Email, phone number, whatever it is that you want people to use. Um, on my business's website, for example, I don't have my phone number because I don't like when people call me. Uh, the only way to contact me is my email. Um, so give them whatever that is. Or even if you don't want to put your email out there for whatever reason, at least have a contact form. And so the contact form will go to your email without giving out your email address to people. Have some way for them to contact you because even if it's something like you just have a photo collection, people are going to want to ask you about ask you questions about it. They're going to want to ask you if they can use your pictures, things like that. Questions do come up. So give people a way to get a hold of you. And then if you are a business or organization, have your social media links. Where else can people find you? Um, because not everybody checks websites constantly, but they do check Facebook or Instagram or whatever every single day. The way you lay these out could be a lot of different ways. You could have separate pages for each of these. You could have a one page website where all of this is on one page and it's just in different sections, but you need to have this information on your site. Some important terms we're going to be discussing that you just need to know as basics. Um, there's really two main things on your website. There's the domain, um, that's what you were talking about. This is the web address for your website. Way back in the early days, you had to type a long string of uh, numbers to get the IP address. We don't do that anymore. We just type goosefoot.org or helpinghands.org or whatever. Uh, think of it as the address to your home that people put in their GPS to get to your place. So the domain is one thing, and then you also have hosting. This is the space that your website exists in. Um, so basically, it's the how it's your the space in your house where you put all your furniture. You do need both of these. A lot of sites out there, a lot of platforms do offer both. You know, you can go to GoDaddy and buy a domain and hosting. Um, but you can also buy them separately. They don't all have to go together. If, if everything is really confusing and overwhelming, I recommend getting them together just so then you don't, you have one login you have to remember um, and you only have one place you have to keep your billing information updated, but you don't have to buy these together. And then the other one you're gonna have to worry about is your SSL. This is a security certificate. This is a thing that tells the, the internet at large that your website is safe and legitimate. Um, and it also encrypts any passwords, any, if people are putting credit card data, that's the encryption. Um, there are technically two kinds of SSLs. There's HTTP and HTTPS. You used to be able to go to either one. HTTP was fine really if you weren't processing credit cards, but nowadays, all of the web, all of the major web browsers put a lock on the address bar. And if it's green, that means that's HTTPS site. It means it's super secure and it's safe. It's fine. If you have an HTTP address, it will be red, which tells people this site might be questionable. And so a lot of people are scaring away from those sites. So you used to be able to choose either. I would choose HTTP, HTTPS no matter what site you're doing. HTTPS. HTTPS. And then this is after this is where you get the www dot address. You don't see this most of the time because browsers nowadays they just use the little lock icon and then they just take everything away except for you know Facebook.com or goosefoot.org or whatever website you're on. But there. Um, a lot of platforms we're going to be talking about today have an option for online, or they, it, it's automatically included in the package, but a lot of ones have to pay extra for that. Hold on, let me, I'm just realizing that. Um, there we go. That's fine. 
So costs, everybody wants to know how much your website is going to cost. And my answer, unfortunately, is it depends. <laughs> depends on which platform you go with and what you're doing. Don domain names can cost you anywhere from $10 to $25 a year. Again, largely just whatever platform you go with. This is the thing you need to be the case careful with. As you learned, you have to maintain domains every year. You have to pay for them every year. It's not a once and done kind of thing. As soon as you stop paying for it, it kind of goes back out on the open market and anyone could take it from you. You can buy multi-year packages, but I will caution you, domains are especially one of the biggest ones that fall tricky. Um, a lot of sites will take advantage of you. Uh, sites like GoDaddy will get hit like, hey, get your domain for two bucks or five bucks. But you have to read the fine print and it tells you it renews at $14 a year. So yeah, it's $5 for the first year, but then you're going to be paying more. Um, so if it seems like a really good deal, it is. <laughs> Make sure you read the fine print. Whatever you pay is fine, um, but whatever domain registrar you go with, that's whoever you buy the domain from. Buy as long of a package as you can afford. You know, if you can buy it three or five years out, that's something you have to worry about a lot less frequently, but also you'll usually get better rates, but then it'll cost you maybe a hundred dollars for those three years or something. I don't know. Um, just make sure you read the fine print on those. Hosting. Hosting can be anywhere from $100 a year. This is most of your um, website. If you're doing it yourself, most of the cost is going to be in the hosting. Um, and again, it depends on which platform you go with, how much it is. I'll, I have the costs in each of them as we go through the major like six that I talk about. Hosting? hosting is, that's the space in your house that your furniture is in. So that's the, where your content of your website actually exists. You're basically buying server space for whatever you put on your website to sit somewhere on a computer. And then the domain points to that location. If you're expecting higher traffic for your site, it's gonna cost you more. Uh, Coopville Chambers hosting is a lot more than uh, somebody who sells stuff out of their house and primarily sells off of Etsy because there's a lot more visitors to the Chambers site than there is to that site. And you only get X amount of bandwidth so you have to pay more for more bandwidth, which lets more people see it at a faster speed. Uh, the website builder is usually included with the hosting and it is with all the ones I'm talking about here. Um, there are exceptions to that. WordPress, for example, is a content management system and most of the major hoster, hosters can install it for you. So it's free because it's open source. Um, but there's also ones like Drupal and Joomla that I'm not talking about today. Um, and those are separate from hosting, but usually where most of the things the folks in this workshop are gonna be looking at, they're built in together. Uh, so SSL, your security certificate. Like I said, this is either going to be free, so included in what you're already paying, or it can cost you up to $250 a year. Again, depends on what features you need and what site you get it from. Um, and then, so your total is going to be like a minimum of $110 a year, maximum of $800 a year. Um, you can get free websites, but they don't come with security necessarily. You can't have your own domain. It'll be, you know, whatever dot wix.com instead of just whatever.com. Um, and then even that total does not include your time or any additional plugins or software you might need. So it might be higher than that. Um, it is, you know, it's not free. It's not super cheap, but it's so vital in these, this day and age because everybody checks for stuff online first. Any questions on this before I move on? Okay. So now I'm going to talk about the big major platforms that I recommend using. Uh, WordPress is first because it's genuinely my favorite. It's the one I use for the vast majority of my clients. Uh, there's millions of themes out there and a theme is, uh, pre somebody else made a design for you and you're just going in and customizing it. In the old days, you had to code everything by hand. Themes make it so you don't have to. Somebody already did most of the coding for you. You just need to change it up. 
Yeah, so there are millions and millions of themes on WordPress. The good ones are going to cost you money, and you can find them on sites like themeforest.net. There are tons for free, though, if you can find one that you like that's free. Um, the fun thing about WordPress is it's pretty unlimited in what you can do with it. If you can think about it and you have the skill for it, you can probably do it with WordPress. That being said, because there's virtually no ceiling to what you can do, it also has a very steep learning curve. <laughs> so if you jump into a WordPress site, it might be a little hard to figure out on your own. It can be intimidating. That being said, again, WordPress is open source. So there are so many videos and tutorials and websites out there to help you figure out everything. And a lot of the themes you, if you buy a theme, they usually come with documentation that tells you how to set it up, how to update it, how to use it. Um, so use those resources that exist. WordPress can cost anywhere from $4 a month to $45 a month if you do hosting through wordpress.com. Um, again, that depends on what features you want and how big of a site you wanna build. There is a free option for WordPress if you go to wordpress.org, um, but again, you're limited in what you can do with your website. Most hosting companies, if you go with somebody that's not WordPress, can set up the platform for you. Um, back in the day, I had a lot of websites hosted with Woodby Telecom and they can install WordPress. Nowadays, I use sites like GoDaddy or, or uh, Bluehost. There's HostGator, there's a billion things out there, but they, most of them have a WordPress option. If WordPress is too much for you, uh, GoDaddy is probably another really big popular one. They have built their own website builder. They can set up WordPress for you, but they have a GoDaddy website builder instead if you wanna go with that one. Um, it's again, drag and drop builder. So here's your options of boxes of kinds of content, drag it to whatever point on the page you want it to be at and then fill it in. GoDaddy does have pretty good support. Um, I, I lament for other sites often because I have to call them and then sit on hold forever. But GoDaddy, if they're busy, I call them and they're like, press this button and we'll call you back when it's your turn. I'm like, thank you. Um, they also have a really great chat option too. So good support. Um, they do have free options again that are very limited or you can pay up to $49.99 a month. So pretty big window. Um, and keep in mind, these rates are a month if you are paying for the year. So 50 bucks, 12, 12 months. Yeah, it's going to cost you 600 when you set up the site. Uh, they do have a month rates that are actually monthly, but they're going to be a little higher. And on that note, they do have really high renewal rates. Usually when you can set up a GoDaddy site, it'll cost you $12 to get started. And next year, it's going to renew at $50. So make sure you read the fine print. Um, again, and as you're going through the process, they're gonna give you frequent upsells. They're gonna be like, you can build a site for free. Oh, you wanna sell stuff on it? That's gonna cost you another $20. Oh, you wanna do this? It's gonna cost you a little bit more. Um, and if you go with free plan, they or the lower cost plans, they do not back your site up and they do not give you a free SSL. You'll have to pay for that. Um, backups are incredibly important because if anything goes wrong on your site and things frequently do, uh, some error in the system, something updates and it breaks the code somewhere and your whole site goes down and it's a genuinely panicky feeling. But if you have a backup, you can just upload that and it'll revert back to that stage. And so you might need to do some updates, but it'll be fixed again and it won't be all gone and you don't have to start from scratch. So if you go with something free, make sure you have some sort of tool in there that will let you back your site up. That's incredibly important. Next up, Squarespace. Uh, Squarespace is the first one I'm talking about that's really a website builder. Um, it costs anywhere from 16 to $49 a month, depending on what level you get. I think the $16 one, for example, doesn't let you do e-commerce. Um, that starts at the like 27 and the 49. They do their own built-in templates. You can't go out and find stuff in the wild necessarily, uh, but they have 110 to go through. And in my opinion, out of all the website builders, they are the prettiest. It is a very visually focused system. They put in, they put a big premium on images. They want you to use them, um, but it is a little harder to use than some of the other ones. 
that are drag and drop builders that are even easier. Uh, they do have some limited drag and drop features. You can only put things in certain places and you do need a little bit of HTML coding skills. Uh, for example, the Netflix website is on Squarespace. Uh, I have to code in line breaks and colors on their menu to get it to look like that on the screen. But they do again have a lot of tools on the Squarespace platform that tell you this is how you do it. Um, and again, it's very visually oriented, centered on big images. Wix is probably the most popular site builder. Um, you can get a free Wix site if you leave the Wix brand ad. So at the top of the page, every page, it'll say, this website is built on Wix. And then the web, the URL will be, you know, goosefoot.wix.org or whatever. Um, if you don't want those things on your site, it's going to cost you about $16 to $59 a month. Um, and again, they're really bad about upsells as well. You start building on something. Wix frustrates me because it'll let you do it first, but it won't let you save it unless you agree to the upcharge. And I hate that. Like warn me ahead of time. Don't let me do all the work of setting something up and then take it away from me <laughs> or charge me for it. They have about 800 templates of your system that you can choose from if you want your website to look for. Um, they also have built-in SEO tools. So that's the search engine optimization. Um, the other ones I talked about have those tools. You just have to install them. It doesn't come ready-made on every site. They also have built-in backup. So they will back your site up for you, which is great. Um, it's very flexible drag and drop builder. You can change size of things, positions, everything like that. A lot of the other website builders are more in relation to each other. So this thing will be below this thing or next to this thing. Wix, and I think Weebly lets you stretch it of like, no, I want this block to be this much big, whether the content takes up that much space or not. Um, and on that note, Weebly, uh, the second most popular site builder. I probably like it even like less than Wix, <laughs> but that's me personally. I know lots of people who love Wix and Weebly. Um, again, Weebly costs you zero to $26 a month. Um, there's about 80 themes, so a lot less than Wix, and I, I think they don't look as good. Um, has the built-in SEO tools, and then you can drag and drop things with limited customization, a little more like Squarespace. And again, you have to be weary of frequent upselling. They'll let you build something and then say, oh, actually, that's going to cost you more. Shopify is probably my newest one on this list. Um, Shopify exists primarily as a commerce tool. So it is for selling stuff. That is why it was developed. Um, it's basically like Square or PayPal. It's meant for putting your products online and selling stuff. They got so popular that they're like, you know what? Let's do a website builder around it. So you can not only set up your tool, but you can also go ahead and just build a whole site. Um, it is probably one of the pricier ones out of the option. Plans start at $29 a month and they go up to $299 a month. And that's largely based on the volume of your sales. So if you have a very popular store, it's gonna cost you more. Um, that being said, they do, because again, it's meant for commerce. Uh, they have their own payment system. I think they work with Stripe. Um, and if you have a higher plan, your fees per product are a lot cheaper than if you have the cheaper plan. They only have about 11 free themes available, and then they have over a thousand available for extra money. Um, they're usually a couple hundred dollars each. Um, you can do the e-commerce on there, but you can also do point of sale. So if you have a physical store, Square, uh, uh, Shopify is really nice because they send you the payment processor to charge in person as well. So if you sell stuff online, and then you want to go to a farmer's market or if you have a physical store, it's all the same system, which is really nice. They also use the drag and drop builder. So you just grab something and you put it where you want it. Um, they do have higher transaction fees. I think most standard online payment functions are like 2.9% plus 30 cents per transaction. Um, and I think that's the rate at their middle of the road plan. Their cheaper plan is like 35 cents plus 2.9%. Um, but again, they have phenomenal support. Probably the best one out of the lot, even better than GoDaddy. So 
pr pricey, but for now they are giving enough features to justify it if it got what you want. And with all of these, I will say, they all have a free trial period. Um, GoDaddy's is the least amount of time. You have 24 hours, maybe 48 hours um, to figure out if you like it. But a lot of the other ones, most of the website builders, Squarespace, Wix, Weebly, uh, Shopify, you have like at least a week, if not longer, to go ahead and get in there and start setting up a site and seeing if you even like it all before they ask you to pay anything which is really nice because then you have time to go play with different tools and see this one just confuses me, but this one really works. So I'm going to stick with that. SEO, you'll hear that term lobbed around a lot in website circles. It means search engine optimization. It is giving yourself the best possible results in search engines that you can get. Um, you want to be pretty highly ranked. The way you get this is content is king early days of websites, even 10, 15 years ago, SEO used to be its own language. You used to have to be very careful with coding in keywords and, and doing all these little tips and tricks. Search engines are constantly changing their algorithm and how they work so that they can give people the best of what they're asking for and not what people are gaming the system for. So nowadays, instead of the keywords, websites are actually pulling from the content of your website. So if people want to be able to find, if you want people to find you looking for uh, clothing on Whidbey Island, you better have the words Whidbey Island and clothing somewhere on your website. Um, somewhere in the body of the text, somewhere in the name of an image, the description of an image. It needs to actually exist on your site. It can't be something, these meta keywords that just sort of exist in the code and no one gets to see them because search engines don't even look at those anymore. So make sure your content is up to snuff. It's good. It's readable. It makes sense. It reads like something someone would actually read, not a jumble of words because uh, those search engines have gotten smart to that. Think beyond commercial keywords. The majority of a search engine users start with a question. Answer that question. Um, so, you know, people use, you know, where to eat on Whidbey. This is the best place to eat on Whidbey Island. Um, you know, use, use those terms like you are answering the question, but still in a way that actually makes sense on your website. Because if you people come to your website and it's just a jumble of answering questions, they're gonna leave your website. And the more people do that, the more the search engine is told, oh, people didn't actually want this context. I'm wrong. I'm going to give them something else instead. Uh, really highly ranked in requirements for search engines is your website mobile friendly. Because again, the majority of people are using phones or tablets to access the internet. So it needs to work on that or a mobile search engine is not even going to show them the site. If it sizes weirdly, if things are unclickable, uh, it's just not even going to give it to them. And how do you get it? How do you figure it out? So a lot of the programs we've talked about today have that built in. Um, Wix and Weebly and Squarespace, um, Squarespace especially, but I think Wix and Weebly as well. In the top menu bar, there's usually some kind of icon that looks like a computer. And you can click on that and change it to tablet or phone. It'll resize it to show you this is what it looks like. Beat even that, I don't necessarily trust it. So what I do is I actually go and check it on multiple devices. The computer I work on at home is a really big monitor. I have a laptop that's a more standard size screen. I have a tablet in the office that I can pull stuff up to check. I'll check stuff on my phone. Um, I'll send it to a friend and be like, does this look okay to you? Is it doing anything weird? Uh, so I will, I will manually check it on different devices and fix whatever's going on. WordPress, you can get in the biggest trouble because there are a lot of WordPress themes that aren't mobile friendly yet or and that requirement. So you got to be careful with what you pick. They'll usually say they're mobile friendly in the description of the theme. Links, you got, your site needs to talk to the rest of the internet. It's not all about you. So links help your search engine optimization if you are pointing to other places and other places are pointing to you. So you want your website linked, your Facebook, your Instagram, 
Um, if you're a member of a chamber of commerce, they usually put all of their members and their websites on their website. And then you could in the footer of your website be like proudly a member of this chamber. So you're pointing to each other. Um, if you work in partnership with somebody, if you carry a certain line of product from a certain somebody else or somebody carries your product, you can point to each other. And all of these links help um, the search engines realize this is a legitimate website because other people are talking about it and it is talking to other people. Make sure you speed test your website. There are a lot of tools out there. I will just usually Google website speed tester and then you can put in your domain name and it'll do its thing and tell you, you have a passing grade or failing grade and here's why. These things are slowing your site down. Now keep in mind, you don't have to get an A. Um, I think if I put goosefoots in, I think we usually get like a B, but YouTube gets a C, so I'm better than YouTube. <laughs> Um, but the speed test just lets you know, hey, here's where your site is failing or here's where it's doing really well. And some of those things you can fix, you know, oh, this image is way too big. I need to resize it smaller so it's not slowing the site down as much. But other things, you know, oh, I have a video linked on that page and it's slowing it down. Too bad that video is important. I'll just live with it. And how do you so again, I'll just go to Google and type in website speed test. And then a lot of the sites talked about, a lot of the tools have built-in search engine optimization tools. If you're using something like WordPress, there's a really handy plugin called Yoast that you can install. It's Y-O-A-S-T. Um, I really like Yoast because it'll pop up on every single page that you're when you're in the editing section. And at the bottom, it'll tell you yellow, green, or red stoplight of how the page is doing and why. Are you using too high a uh, language? Because for websites, um, shorter sentences and easier to understand words better. Um, are you, do you have, does the page title actually match with the content? Did you label all the pictures, stuff like that? It'll tell you, hey, here's where your site's not doing so well. And then also it'll usually give you a tool uh, if you came to my Facebook class or if you watched it on YouTube, um, you can post links on Facebook and it'll think about it for a second and it'll go pull an image and a brief clip of text from that page to show on the post. Using a tool like Yoast, you can control what that is. You can tell the search engines and other sites, I want you to use this image, not all of the other images. And I want you to pull this pull text, not whatever is actually the first text of the page. So those are really helpful tools. And again, it's free, but there are paid options if you want upgrades. I have a question. Yeah. Um, I, I think that it's about a year ago, I finished the Udemy course in digital marketing, and they spent a lot of time on SEO. And they uh, were pretty, pretty emphatic about keywords. And it led me to the impression that I should understand by SEO requirements and my keyword requirements before I built the site. Because they said URL, uh, a domain name, keywords they were getting looked at, headers, or HQs, and stuff like that. It does come your website. website. And that's the thing. You, you need to have those keywords built into the actual content of your site, not as coded meta keywords. Okay, that, okay. So it needs to be. Like, yeah. 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 That is the thing I for, I didn't really emphasize at the beginning when I said early before you get started, you need to know what your website is supposed to do. That includes who the website's supposed to be targeted to. Who do is it that you want to talk to? Because nobody in this room is for everybody. That's not how small businesses work. You have a core demographic that would be better for you. Um, if somebody else outside of that wanders up, great, you'll take them. But there is a certain age range, gender, location that works for each of you. You need to know that when you get started, because that's going to affect, you know, what keywords you use, the layout you pick, the size of the font. If I'm talking to 20-somethings, 
I can probably get away with a smaller font than if I'm targeting retired folks because they need to be able to see better. Um, so these are all things you need to know when you get started to, to build an effective website. I know this is not an SEO thing, and that is that there are some very uh, good tools out there to help uh, to identify the keywords. Yeah. You competitors might be using and want to know how to choose those. Right. Yeah. So SEO is a whole big thing. I could spend an entire class on it, but it's so individual to each of you. So does anybody have any questions on it in general before we move on? <laughs> I'm going to talk about um, accessibility and then it's open floor time. So, um, oh, analytics, I forgot analytics. Analytics are the data of what your website's doing. So how can you know what you're doing well without asking? A lot of the tools I've talked about have them built in. Squarespace, Rix, Weebly, I think. They either have them built in or you can buy them for like a minimal amount of money. Um, WordPress, there are a lot of tools you can install to get your analytics. Um, so analytics are usually website traffic. Number of people visiting your site. Um, referral site, where are they coming from? Are they going directly to your website with your domain name? Are they finding you on Google, Facebook, some other site that you've never heard of? Um, did an article talk about you and a bunch of people are finding you from that? You can find that out and then go thank them. Um, what search terms are people using to find your site? Are they the search terms you want them to be using? If not, you should probably adjust the content on your site if you don't want to be coming up in those kinds of search terms. How much time are they spending on the page? Uh, the vast majority of your content, no matter what you do, is going to be very like a couple of seconds. Um, that's just how people browse the internet. They're either it doesn't load fast enough or it's not the content they want. They misclicked. Um, that's pretty normal. Um, but if you're getting like 90% bounce rate, something is very wrong with your site. It's not functioning. Um, it, it's really coming up in the wrong search results. Something is wrong and you need to fix it. Um, bounce rate, that's people coming in immediately leaving. So that is specifically called out. Oh, time on page also helps you know what content you've got on your site that's actually popular. You know, do you have some random throwaway article in your blog that's getting a lot of attention? Hey, maybe you should spend more time on that. It's bringing a lot of people in. Top page, what is the most popular page on your site? Where are people going to visit? Again, if it's not where you actually want them, maybe restructure your site. But if it just lets you know like what people are spending their time on, what's drawing people in. And then conversion rate, that's people actually going through your site rather than just one page. Um, this can be really fun because again, you can, depending on how nitty gritty that data gets, you can see how people are going through your site. You know, did you point them to a specific page on Facebook? Well, then that Facebook ad is doing really well. Are they naturally drawn from one page to go check out another and another and another? You've got really good flow through your site. If those things are suffering, it gives you a pretty good indication where you need to tweak and what you need to improve to let people see more of your site. Your homepage is usually one of your top pages, but sometimes it can be some random page on your website. It's fun to see that data. And again, that helps you improve it over time. Oh, so I've got some, again, basic design tips. Keep your navigation menus short. So that's your menu at the top of the site that lets people go to different pages. If you have different pages, you want those to be one or two words max. Um, I've had some clients that are like, can we have a sentence here? No, <laughs> because there's only so much room on the top of the page. And depending on your site's coding, how it's meant to be laid out, it will either push your menu into multiple layers that takes up more page of your site, or it'll cut stuff off and put it behind another drop-down menu. So you want to keep those as short as possible. If you look at Goosefoot's website, I don't think I have a screenshot of it. Um, our menus are like home, about, workshops, art, stuff like that. It's, it's short, maybe one or two words. The page title can be a longer thing, but the menu items, you want those to be as short and to the point as possible. 
Uh, navigation can also happen in multiple places. People's brains work differently. The way they go about sites works differently than yours. So I've had some clients that I've had multiple ways to get to a page and they've been like, this is redundant. And I'm like, no, you don't know what you're talking about. So, you know, I, I'll just pull it up instead of referring to it. Goosefoot's website. Um, I drop box, not what I want. Goosefoot.org. This computer is a little slow, so I apologize for the loading time. Um, give me full screen. Thank you. So here's our menu. These are all short. Community resources, events and arts, business resources, explore and shop about short things. Um, and even in the drop downs, they're also shorter. Some of them are a little longer, but they're also pretty short. So you can get to pages from here, but you can also get to these main hub pages from here. You can also get to specific things. You know, this is the current workshop. You can get to that from here instead of going to workshops, then this, then that. Um, you can find more about our major things also from here. So there's like three different places that a single page can be linked on the homepage. And that's fine because people think about things in different ways and they're looking for different things. Um, you know, not everybody's going to think to find Shop the Goose Grocer under um, about. <laughs> so it's okay to have your um, site linked to the same things in different ways so that you are there for people, no matter how their brains work, no matter how they typically navigate a site. Make sure you stick to a consistent color palette. It's very amateurish when you use a different color for everything. Um, it's a lot better, especially when you're new to it, to stick to like two to three colors. You know, have the headlines be one color and the body of the text be this color. The biggest thing is definitely make sure your hyperlinks are a different color than the rest of the text so that people can find them. Um, white space is your friend. White space means all of this space on the page that is not taken up with content. It's just a big block of color or a photo that gives people's eyes a place to rest because when your page is so jammed with text and content, it gets exhausting. So it's nice to have that space to rest. It can also divide things up and help guide the eye the way you want it to go. You don't have to fill every single space. If you look at a site from the like early 2000s, Ooh, those sites were busy. Bare bone sites are the trend right now. The more sparse, the more focused, the more that's what's trending right now. That's what most people are used to seeing. White space does not have to be white, by the way. Uh, white space can, you know, this top red bar, that's also white space. Just means there's not content there. Break up your text into smaller pieces. You know, something like a newspaper, let steal this from you for a second. This is small bit because it's a small column. If you have as long of a paragraph of text on a website, it might look fine on your computer screen, but if I'm on a phone, it's gonna look like it takes up the entire page. So no matter what your natural writing style is, break your stuff up into smaller chunks it's a lot less intimidating and approachable to people. It's a lot less intimidating and more approachable. Again, make sure how your site looks on multiple devices. If you don't own multiple devices, ask your friends if you can borrow theirs. The library, a lot of libraries have different kinds of devices you can borrow or rent. Um, so check it on different site, different platforms if you can to make sure it looks fine and it's not doing anything really weird. You're never gonna be 100% on top of that. Um, because there's an infinite array of screen sizes and even the dynamic ones have, you know, specific coding where, you know, if it's 800 pixels, it looks fine. A thousand pixels, it looks fine. But it's 870, it's doing something weird. You're never going to be 100% on top of anything, but you can at least check to make sure that for most people, the site is behaving correctly. Um, and even we do this. I mostly look at Goosefoot's website on my desktop because that's when I'm updating it. My boss emails me like, hey, the website's doing something weird and it's putting 
on these pages, it's putting the sidebar content above the page content instead of below it like it's supposed to. I didn't see because I hadn't looked at it on other devices for a while. So keep an eye on your site, especially after updates. Um, get inspiration from other sites. Uh, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Is that how that saying goes? Um, even when I'm working with clients, I adore it when they give me links of like, I really like these websites for these specific things. I don't like how this website did that. It's okay to go and look around and see like, ooh, I like this website I, and, and think why. What is it? What's appealing about the website? Is it the colors they used, the fonts, the pictures, the layout? Can you use tools that you have access to to maybe create something similar? Websites are never finished. There is never a point where you're going to be like, great, good, done. Because you need to keep the content updated. You need to keep updating it for the search engine. Um, there's always going to be something that you're going to come back to and go, ooh, I forgot about this, or I have a better way of doing it now. Um, you're going to need to update your website and maintain it. Coding changes constantly. And if you're not checking in on your site and making sure it's still functional, your website could be down for months at a time and you had no idea. So keep an eye on your site, keep it updated. You know, even if you poke through the Goosefoot site, it's massive. I guarantee you, you're going to find at least one, maybe two or three pages that say this page is under construction because we're still working on it, or the content that was on that page is now outdated and not useful for people. The most important thing for most websites is good images. We as a society are very visual people. We want to see pictures. Um, so if you have your own product, if you are, you know, you are the product or whatever you're trying to talk about, if you're not, a professional photographer, invest in one. It's going to cost you money, but it's better to have at least a small array of really good pictures that you can use on your website and social media. Um, so, you know, think about hiring one if you don't have that skill set, um, or at least get some good equipment. Most phones these days can take really stellar pictures, but if you have a phone that's, you know, we were talking about you had an iPhone 6, probably not the best pictures. When you are using images, especially high quality images, make sure you compress them. Images are massive. The file size on raw images, especially, or even highly edited ones, takes up a lot of space. And the bigger your image, it's gonna slow your entire website down. So you're going to want to resize it. For a lot of picture, a lot of pictures, a lot of websites, I usually resize it down to about 800 pixels wide or high, whatever the bigger one is. It's gonna depend on your site. Um, there are free online tools you can use to reduce the size of an image, but also I think I just use Photoshop a lot. Um, and especially on mobile devices, there is a free version of Lightroom, which is a video uh, image editing app. So you can get Lightroom free on mobile. Mm-hmm. They're all Adobe programs and Adobe programs cost a lot of money. So that's why I'm saying mobile Lightroom is free, which is great. Um, if you uh, never use images from Google search, they are, the vast majority of them are copyright. And if you use them, you're breaking someone's copyright and you could get sued. I have had people email me and be like, hey, this client's website is using my picture. Um, take it down or I'll take you to court. And I didn't know because the client just provided me the image. So don't ever just Google search an image. There are ways you can change the usage rights to commercial use. So if you know how to do that, you can do that. But I would very much prefer, you know, go look for free stock images if you don't have images yourself. Um, Pixabay is one of my favorites. It's got a huge array of library that is open. Anybody can use it for any reason. You don't have to pay for it. And it's got some really quality images on anything you could think of, physical objects, but even just you could put in stress, joy, happiness, the ocean, get a huge array of stuff, even videos sometimes. But there's a bunch of more out there. Pixabay is my favorite. And you can also pay for some. Yes, because you own the copyright. Or even if you know somebody, like somebody else took the picture, like so the Coopville Chamber website, 
there are professional photographers that live in Coopville and they've taken tons of pretty pictures and they're okay with the chamber using it. We just ask them first, like, hey, can I use this image? You know, that's what I say to you, that website of photos. Somebody might ask you, I really like this image. Could I use it? Okay. Um, but so if you use these image, ask them. If somebody in the nonprofit here gets permission. Um, but make sure you have the rights to use that picture. If a physical location or an event, whatever, you can also just let it generally know, like, we will be taking pictures at this event. If you come to the street dances in the summer, I have a professional photographer come and take those pictures. We pay him, so then I own the pictures. I can use them. Accessibility. Accessibility is incredibly important. Um, not only because, you know, there are a lot of people that have various disabilities, vision, hearing impairment. Um, so not only is it just nice to be accessible to those people, you're actually legally required to do it. Websites fall under the Americans with Disability Act. You need to make sure your websites are accessible. Um, doesn't matter how small you are. If somebody found your site and it's not, they could sue you. Um, so it's just kind of a game of, will I get caught? But again, it's just really nice to offer to people. Some really low level things you can do that make it accessible to a lot more people. Whenever you upload an image to your site, add alt text. Whatever type you're using, there is usually some field. This is a screenshot from WordPress. When you upload the picture, once it finally uploads, it goes, it gives you this panel. So it'll show you the file name and the date you added it and the size of it. But here, here's the URL for where it's located. Here's the title. You can change that from whatever it was when you uploaded it. There's also an alt text field. So alt text is a thing. That's what comes up when either the image doesn't load or somebody can't see the picture. People with severe vision impairments use things called screen readers. It goes along the page and it reads them for them. They can't the screen reader doesn't know what that picture is unless you tell it. So, you know, that it's a picture of chocolate chip cookies and milk. Can, you, can, you can have them really brief descriptions like that. You know, a lot of ours are like the, the historic school building at Bayview Corner or, you know, Goosefoot staff in front of the office or anything like that. Just tell the computer what's actually in the picture. This is good in two ways. One, it makes it more accessible and open and accessible for everybody. But also that helps with your search engine results because that's another thing telling the computer what's on your site. Make sure you use headings properly. So when you have a site, you can usually, whatever text you're entering, you can usually select options. One, heading two, heading three, all usually down to heading six or paragraph or pull quote, there's different styles coded into the site to make things appear the way they are. Um, make sure you use those and you don't skip. So don't go like heading one, heading four, heading three, because then the computer can start to worry it missed something somewhere. And make sure you set that up in the site's coding. There will usually be a section, site style or design or whatever that you set those up of what font you want it to be, what color, how big, um, so rather than using paragraph text and then just increasing the size and color of that particular one, use a heading because that helps the screen readers as well. Give links descriptive names. So if you're putting a link on your site, instead of click here to read about our company, which I will admit we're really guilty of on our site, try instead to learn more about our company, read about us. Because just like you guys will scan through a site trying to find a link to something that you're looking for, screen readers do the same thing. Somebody using a screen reader can say, tell me what the links on this page are. And it'll just read the links out. So if you have the first, it'll be going down, click here, click here, click here, click here. And that doesn't make sense to a person. But if it's instead about us, our story, contact us, that makes a lot more sense. Make sure you use color with care. I don't remember the statistics, but I think it's like 8% of people are colorblind. That's not a, but that's still a decent amount of people. So be careful of the colors you're using. You want high contrast colors. 
You know, don't use light gray on a white background. That's really hard for anybody to read. Don't use red text on a green background. Colorblind people can't see that at all. Um, so make sure you're using high contrast colors. Be simple with the colors like I talked about earlier. Um, and make sure you're avoiding common colorblind colors. You know, if your um, required fields are all in red, that's going to be a little hard for colorblind people to see. Make sure you avoid tiny font. Anything like 11 points or lower is really small on most people's screens to read. And if your site isn't mobile friendly, they're not going to be able to resize it. On that note, I don't know if I included that on there, but don't put text on images that's vital. Um, that's one of my big pet peeves. I want to work with the chamber. I'll do their newsletter and people will send me flyers <laughs> to put in the newsletter. Cool. If somebody's reading the thing on their phone, they can't read the text on your flyer because it's tiny on their phone. But if you give me instead an image and actual text, the text will automatically resize depending on what screen they're on. So avoid putting like a PDF on your website because people can't read that. If you are doing so, use tables for data, not for layout. Ages ago, you used to pretty much have to use tables to get things where you want. That's not how it is anymore, especially with a lot of the website builders. They do the drag and drop. You can just put things in opposite ends. If when a screen reader comes across a table, it will tell them table, table with six columns and five rows, and then it'll read each one out. If you're using a table for your layout, that is so baffling to listen to. So don't use tables for layouts, only use it for data. Make sure your website is navigable by keyboard only. Some people have motor disability. They can't use a fine mouse or something. So instead what they'll do, let me go back to the Goosefoot website. They will navigate with their keyboard only. So what that means is instead of clicking like I am right now, I'm using the up and down arrows to scroll. Uh, somewhat, yeah, it's it, a lot of sites have it built in. You just need to test your website. Um, and again, a lot of them might have accessibility features somewhere in the layout description. Um, you can also navigate the site by hitting the tab. So ours, unfortunately, something I don't like is it starts with the newsletter sign up at the bottom. Oh, um, Max, it just does that. Great. Thanks, Max. When I was checking this last night on my phone or on my home computer, I can actually Whoa, what happened? Um, I can actually, on a PC, when I hit tab, it will actually go to each of the menu items. So I could tab to it and then hit enter to pull that menu up instead. Um, so these are, again, just things to check and see if your website is doing. Because so some people can't use a mouse. And you can go away, thank you. Describe videos. If you have a video on your site, um, again, describe what's in that video. Somewhere, if you have a video on one of your pages, under the video, you can type out the transcript of what the video is talking about. If people are talking, type that out. Um, you can see this on some news articles. If you go to Como's website, for example, and it's a video, it's a video-based um, news article they have the entire like the video description or transcript under the video for people who can't hear or watch video so it's a little less extra work but it's worth it so that it's usable for anybody no matter their skills or abilities okay so i've dumped a whole lot of info into your guys' brains now it's time for questions we can pull stuff up obviously you see i'm web connected i have accounts on some of the major uh, platform so we could go look at stuff. We could look, log into your guys' websites if you want to show everybody. This is your guys' time. If you have something specific you want to ask, it's just like a short question and you don't want to ask it in front of everybody, my contact info is here. You're welcome to reach out to me and I'll point you towards the right resources. Oh, and before we get into questions, let me show you guys one more thing. Who in this room has a library card? Basically, everybody, great. Uh, I love our library so much. Um, and they can help you in this too. 
So if you go to Snow Isle Library, snowisle.org, go to the library site. And I'm going to go to online resources. Um, you can go to all resources if you want. I usually go to business and finance because it's the page I spend the most time on. So again, online resources, business and finance. Here's a whole bunch of resources I go to in my other classes, but right here, we're going to go to LinkedIn Learning. This used to be called lynda.com, if you're familiar with that, um, but LinkedIn bottom and rebranded it LinkedIn Learning. Hey, um, it, this is a video database on basically everything you could ever want. I'm going to stop sharing for a second. I don't need this in the recording. <laughs> Ooh, did I save it? No, I didn't. It's fine. This is a public computer. I probably shouldn't save it. Yeah, so you put your library card in here. And then your password, whatever your library's password is. Um, nope. What is it? Oh gosh, what did I tell you about this? It might be, that's the default, but I did change it. But yeah, it's not working. Nope, okay, I don't know what I've set my password as. Um, I'm gonna have to. Yeah. I know. <laughs> well, because I do the thing you're supposed to where I have a different password for everything. So I don't remember what I said the password as. But anyway, let me see if I can just go to LinkedIn Learning. Um, I don't want to go to LinkedIn. I know. Yeah. It just doesn't work. It's fine. Nope. It's fine. Um, so, yeah. Um. I'm not learning yet. So if you, any website builder you're using, say you're using Weebly. Um, click first one option. What's the right platform for my website? Um, getting built, started with site builders. Um, so it looks like Weebly specifically isn't really popular, but you know, if you're wanting to do a WordPress one, which it sounds like multiple people in this room are. Getting started with WordPress, WordPress essential training. Uh, advance your skills, five WordPress essentials. So these are all classes you can watch. Ooh, WordPress e-commerce, small business websites. These are all workshops by professionals who do this for a living. Um, they are video tutorials. You can watch them at your own pace. You can stop, rewind things. Um, if you are busy, you know, what the build your WordPress e-commerce skills, that's an eight hour class. M most people don't have time to sit down for eight hours. But you can start watching it as long as you're logged in and then go back. Oh, let me, sorry, I forgot to stop sharing. Um, there we go. So if you, you can start watching, leave, and then come back and it'll remember what point in the video you were at. Um, a lot of them have uh, example files you can download to play with, or you can read the transcript if you're a reader rather than a watcher. Um, you can do it at your own pace. Uh, I really like these. I'm using them to teach myself video editing. Whenever I run into something that I'm like, how do I do this? I go to this. And again, if you log in with your library cards, you get it for free. And it's so helpful. And then a lot of the sites as well have their own learning library that you can get into for lots of help. So that aside, again, I open the floor to questions. Anybody has them? Yes. You, when you were talking about accessibility, mm -hmm. you made a comment, don't put PDFs on your website because the resizing. So you so can I put a link to the PDF so someone can download it. Don't put like a picture of the PDF on as a web page. Right. So don't, yeah. So I don't draw the drag and drop thing into the web page. Right. So yeah. Says, yeah, you can upload it to your media library and then give the people the link to it. 
so that they can then view the PDF or download it, but don't convert it into a picture and then put that as your web page. A lot of websites won't let you put PDFs straight on the page. Sure. <sighs> so the tricky thing with that is technically, yes, you can prove ownership. Copyrights are only valid insofar as that you are willing to defend them. So if you build your website and you've got everything dated and you can prove that you had it up first and then somebody else copies your site, you can threaten to sue them. But if they call your bluff and don't and ignore you, you then have to take them to court or you are giving up your copyright. So that's the tricky thing. So technically, yes, if you can prove original ownership but you have to defend it legally. Yeah, so um, depends on which tool you're using and your layout. Oh, sorry, folks at home, she's asking how you put a copyright strip on your website. Um, depending on what tool you use and which uh, layout you're using, it'll be different, but on web WordPress sites, that's usually in the footer. And there's specifically a footer section. Some some themes have a copyright line and that's where you can put whatever content. And then some, you just need to put text in the footer. No, I think we're okay, but thank you. It's, uh, solve the problem, right? so it's yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of design things you can do. Yeah. HTML or specific content. Um, WordPress is currently on Gutenberg editor. Um, and it's not exactly a drag and drop, but it's closer than it ever was before. So outside of specific themes and content, um, a WordPress page looks different than it did four years ago. Uh, you get these little plus icons and you can push that and it'll give you all of the content blocks types that you're allowed to put in there. So, you know, say you have a text, text stuff, and then you want a picture in there too. You have to upload it as its own separate thing, but then you can get into the, if you click on the picture again, once you've uploaded it, um, a side panel will pop up with options and you can set it as in line, left or right or center, and then you can drag it. It'll automatically be on the top of that paragraph block. You can't get it like in the middle unless you break the paragraph block up. Um, but that's an option now that WordPress has made that it didn't have in the past, which is really nice. So instead of having a picture and then text and then whatever, you can have the picture kind of sitting on the side of all the text. So even WordPress is like, oh, we need to make this a tiny bit easier. Oh, that's it's, uh, free. Um, there are, there are free yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so Elementor is a tool word that you can use on WordPress because again, WordPress is open source, so anybody can make anything for it. Elementor and Divi are both tools you can use on WordPress that turn WordPress into a drag and drop builder. So it goes more like the other ones where here's your content in this sidebar. You can drag it onto the page. I want this here. I want this next to it or under it or beside it. Um, so. Elementor or Divi turn WordPress into drop, drag and drop builder. D I V I. Elementor is my favorite tool. It's what I use for Kubebill. My current favorite tool. <laughs> that changes all the time. Yeah. So if you go to a WordPress site, if you have the full like WordPress content management system, not if you're using wordpress.org, the free version, because they will, um, it doesn't, it limits you because it's the free option. Um, oh gosh, what's one I can use? 
I'm going to go to Bluehost because I don't remember my specific site logins. And if anyone online has questions, like feel free to ask them as well. But I'm getting into this. Recording of the class doesn't include my login. Um, oh no. Is Bluehost down? Oh, no. No, Bluehost is great. Uh, um, I think that'll work. Maybe. Or no, ooh, the, the will festival will. Oops, no, let me keep typing. Is that it? Yeah. Feel free to ask any questions that anyone has while this is loading up. There we go. No? We're using a Windows keyboard on a Mac computer, so it doesn't let me do the keyboard shortcuts. Neither. Okay, so to add do, 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 screen share. to add a new plugin tool on WordPress, um, you've got this nice, you know, sidebar here with all of your site options. And this is you only have this if you're in the full version. If you don't see this normally, you're probably on the free version on WordPress.org. Um, and you'd have to set up a new site and then transfer the content over. But if you're seeing this, there's all of these sidebar options. I'm going to go down here. Templates is how you upload a new template. If you have bought one from elsewhere. Oh, no, that's sorry. That's Elementor templates. Ha, ha. Yeah, no, I need to go to appearance and then themes. Appearance and themes is how you upload a new uh, template for your site if you want to use one. Um, they have some built-in ones usually 2020, whatever, they're on 2023 right now. You can add new ones. So this is how you can look through their library of themes and use one of them that exists on the site. Um, so all of these are free. And if you like the layout or look of any of these, you could install it on your site right now. It's already in WordPress. If you used a site like ThemeForest to find a good one that you wanna use, you have to download the uh, the zip file from there and then upload it to WordPress. Um, and same thing with plugins. So if in this sidebar menu, I go to plugins, I can see all the ones I currently have on my site and what ones need to be updated and whatnot. Um, and then I can either hit add new from here or at the top of this page. So plugins are the little tools that let you do different things. Yoast is a plugin. Um, Elementor is a plugin. Um, so these are some that they advertise that they're pushing within the WordPress system. You can also search ones up here. So say you want a search engine optimization tool, you can just search engine or even SEO. So Yoast, right here. It's free and it's already in WordPress's library. You can cache your site. You can get insights for Google search. So uh, anything you're thinking of doing. WordPress, if you're wanting to sell stuff, again, there's no limit to what you want to use. So whatever tool you're using probably has a WordPress component. I believe like if you set up all of your products in Square, for example, um, so you already have a Square store set up. There are plugins that you can get your Square store pulled to your website. Um, but if you're wanting to use other ones, I think Press's biggest sales tool is called WooCommerce. 
Um, and that lets you set up a store with purchasable stuff. And it's, WooCommerce is nice because you can set up um, physical stuff that you want to ship, or you can set up virtual stuff that people can download. Um, so if you have a class or a file or anything like that, people can buy the tickets on your website. Um, you just need to set up whatever payment processor you're using. So yeah, I like WordPress because there's virtually no limit you can do as long as you have the patience to figure out how to do it. Yes. Um, um, and uh, like you said, uh, if you want, um, okay, this is what I did. Um, when I was setting up my Arthur website, I went to uh, Arthur's Sustainable Writing. Mm -hmm. And um, I saw what I did like and what I didn't like. But one thing I wanted to know how do you find out who hosts their site? Is there a way? There is. So I love snooping on the back end of people. <laughs> yes, that's so, yeah. So again, just Google um, find domain host. Um, and then, you know, the who is lookups, any of these. I usually skip the ad ones because I don't want to. Um, okay. So here we go. Post checker. Um, somebody throw out a website, anything. No, like somebody, like a small business's website. Gentangle. How do you spell that? C-E-N-T-A-N-G-L-E. C-E-N-T-A-N-G-L-E. Dot com? Yeah, I think that's it. Okay. So go ahead and enter it, find host. They're hosted by Cloudflare. Thank you. They use a Shopify website. That's great. That's one more tool. Yeah. And then the nice thing too is if you know it's a WordPress site, or even if you don't, if you just you can also do theme finder and you can find out exactly what theme they're using. So again, if you like the look of someone's site, yeah. what site are they using? <laughs> Can you do something similar? So, you know, again, I was just showing you guys, if you look at Coopville Festival. The tech, it'll go off and think about it. Thank you. Thanks for the ad, I don't want that. It'll spend some time thinking about, it, especially because again, this computer's a little slow. Um, and then it should tell you the theme. That's cool. All right. Yeah. Sometimes if they're not using a WordPress theme or if they're using something that was custom coded by an actual developer, um, it won't give you anything. Um, or it'll say this isn't hosted on WordPress. Um or again, if it developers, it usually has like the developer's name or their business or something similar. Um, I When I was building the Chambers site, I tried to see who did, um, I don't remember the city's name, but somewhere in South Carolina, they have a very pretty site that I was very inspired by. And I was like, what theme are they using? And it's like, they're not using a theme. Damn it. <laughs> but you know, you can at least check around and see, I like this site's look. What theme are they using? Is it one I could maybe use? Because usually these um, theme finders, when it is one that exists, that you can usually click on the name and actually go to where you can buy the theme. And then obviously you'll make it your own with color and layout and stuff like that, but you know, at least gets you one step closer. So yeah. you make like say you have a WordPress site and then you put on Facebook. Yes. You create a business page. Yeah. And then in your about section, yeah. Yeah, so we talked about that in my Facebook class last week, but you do actually need a um, business Facebook page. It is technically against Facebook's terms of service to put a, um, to use a profile, personal profile for business purposes. Huh? <laughs> Something, uh... 
Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, if you're not really, I don't, there's ways you can kind of fly under Facebook's radar, but if you're using your personal profile for business uses, you're kind of playing a gambling game of if Facebook notices, they're going to delete my page or de my, delete my profile. Um, but, you know, it's a risk you can take. Two. Yeah. So usually you have to have a profile to access Facebook and then you can have as many pages as you want. I personally run three, 13 right now. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, different people. No, no, I I have my own profile I very rarely use, but I run 13 organizations pages for them. Um, another thing I didn't really hit on, when you're buying the domain, um, you're usually going to get an option from the registrar on privacy. It's going to cost you more money. Um, I would recommend if you have the budget to spare, buying that privacy. Because otherwise, you know, that tool we use to look up who the domain host is. If I scroll down the page, it will also tell you that holds the website, who holds the URL. If you pay for privacy, then it'll just have whatever the registrar's contact info is, but I've GoDaddy or whatever. If you don't pay for privacy, it will have your email phone number there. And that is how a lot of sales companies, they will look they'll run random URLs through databases like that and pull anybody's email that's out there and then bombard you with stuff. And it's very annoying. So if you have the budget, I would pay for that domain privacy. Oh, and another thing with domains, depending on what system you get it through, there is an annual or semi-annual check to make sure like who owns this and is it legitimate? It's it's kind of government requirements so they can make sure that, you know, a terrorist cell isn't masquerading as a child's toy website or something um, to launder money. So they do occasionally send you information you have to upload or do to prove that you own that domain. If you get emails like that, don't ignore them. Do them. You had a question. Um, I was going to say back to that <laughs> Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so there are a lot of tools that you can integrate your so whatever social media channel, depending on what platform you're using. Um, they pretty much all have stuff that they can go and pull content from your Facebook or your Instagram or whatever, um, and that'll automatically post that content to your site as well. Um, so whatever tool you're using, just look for like Facebook or Instagram and it'll come up. Yeah, go to the plugins. Yeah. Go to the plugins and type in, you know, Facebook or Facebook. Um, oh, I already left the page, but yeah. You can usually find something that'll pull that. And then it's dynamic content. So it's not as good as actually updating your content, but it is at least more, it is it is something changing it. So it's not gonna rank as highly, but you don't have to change the content on your site constantly. That's not the trick. Just, you know, at least once a year, go in and make sure everything's running smoothly. Your contact info is up to date. Um, if you've changed prices or services or anything like that, that's the kind of stuff you need to keep up to date. For website design, yes, I don't have anything else scheduled, um, but we do have a whole slate of business workshops in general. Um, we have in the past, I've done this as a website intensive, so like limited to like four to six people and uh, it's four hours and I give a very short presentation and then the rest of the time you're actually like on your computer working. And I'm here if you were like, how do I do this specific thing? If there's interest, I can bring it back. Um, put it on your feedback forms. Uh, or people at, people at home, I'm going to email you a link to the feedback form. Um, it's uh, intensive. And it doesn't just have to be that. If there's any sort of workshops in general you guys would like to see, those help me 
uh, schedule these and make sure we're actually meeting people's needs. And those flyers are there if anybody wants them. And for people at home, you can just go to goosefoot.org slash workshops. And there's the whole list of workshops coming up. I have them all scheduled through March, but then we'll be doing April, May, and June. I'm so glad. Schedule them out in advance. That's the best class. Yeah. So that, um, for those of you at home, she's uh, very politely ranting about the content calendar class. It was a very yeah. good class. Um, that is recorded and available on our YouTube channel. So pretty much every workshop we did in the last couple of years, um, maybe not the most recent one because the format exists before, but when the pandemic hit, we realized it, we needed to change things, especially because the small businesses in the area were shut down and they needed to get online and they didn't know how to do that. So we did a bunch of classes during the pandemic and then continued hybrid like this um, once things calmed down a bit. And we recorded the classes, so they're available on our YouTube channel. You can watch them at any time. We even did some um, shorter ones that are about 30 to 45 minutes. And we did one specifically on selling online on the different platforms. So, you know, WordPress and Shopify and Squarespace. I actually went through and showed you this is what you do to set it up. Is that fine? Is there a link? Yeah, there is a link on our website. So... You can either go to, again, if you go to goosefoot.org slash, um, make sure I'm typing this right. No, you don't show me the slash and then you add two. I don't understand you. Um, so you can go to goosefoot.org slash workshops. The first ones that are going to come up are the upcoming ones. But if you go past all of these onto a, like older pages, um, so you can see here, starting a business, marketing 101, it's available on YouTube. And that link actually takes you to the video. Um, but you can also go to YouTube itself um, if you don't want to go digging through various back pages of our website. Um, you go to, yeah. go to YouTube and then search for uh, Goosefoot Community Fund, so our full name. Goosefoot Community Fund. Yep, that's our organization's name. And you can see right here, there's the channel. Um, you click on that. Here's all of our videos. And we even organized them into playlists. So you can see social media crash courses. Um, but there are some that aren't there, like getting started and financing. And we've got one on bookkeeping and lots of different classes. I think there's like almost 40 in there by now. Yeah. So those are available at any time. And again, you can pause them, go back, rewatch them, whatever you need. And if you need the handouts from any of them, please feel free to email me and I can send you stuff as well. <laughs> We're here to be as helpful as possible. All right, I'm going to leave one last online. Anybody have any questions? No, I'm good. Thank you. All right. So it sounds like the questions are done. I'm going to go ahead and end the recording here and end the workshop. Um, thank you all for joining me. I'll stick around if anybody in person has questions, but come on. There you go. <laughs>